Hello, good morning to all colleagues in Europe. Good afternoon to colleagues in Japan. We will now start our third keynote speaker, and I would like to welcome and thank to Professor Claudio Semini. So I will make a, a short introduction. And Dr. Claudio Semini is the head of the Dynamic Leg Systems Lab at Instituto Italiano di Tecnologia that developed a number of high-performance hydraulic robots, including IQ, IQ2 Max, and IQ Real. He holds an MSc degree from ETH Zurich in Electrical Engineering and Information Technology. He spent two years in Tokyo for his research, an MSc thesis at Euro's lab at Tokyo Tech, and staff engineer, staff engineer at the Toshiba R&D Center in Kawasaki, working on mobile service robotics. During his PhD and subsequent postdoc at IIT, he developed the quadruped robot IQ and worked on its control. Since 2012, he leads the DLS lab. Claudio Semini is the author and co-author of more than 100 peer-reviewed publications in international journals and conferences. He is also a co-founder of the Technical Committee on Mechanisms and Design of the IEEE Robotic and Automation Society. He is or was the coordinator and partner of several European Union national and industrial projects, including IQ Real, Inail Teleop, MOOC at IET, Joint Lab, and so on. His research interests include the construction and control of highly dynamic and versatile legged robots for field application in real world operations, locomotion, hydraulic drives, and others. And Dr. Claudio Semini will present a talk entitled Quadrupedal Robots for Challenging Tasks on Unstructured Terrains. Dr. Claudio Semini, please, when you want, you can start. Thank you very much once again for your presence here and for having accepted our invitation. Thanks a lot, Manuel. Can you hear me well? Yes, perfectly well. Okay, great. I'll share my screen. Yes, I'm already seeing your screen. Okay, excellent. Like full screen. Yes, Good. now it's full screen. Great. Thanks a lot, Manuel, for the invitation. It's a, a big honor to have a plenary talk at Clo Power. Um, my name is Claudio Simini. I'm from the Italian Institute of Technology. And today I will talk about quadruped robots for challenging tasks on unstructured terrains. So first of all, for those that don't know IIT, the Italian Institute of Technology very well, we're a relatively young research institute that was founded about 15, 20 years ago. The headquarters are in Genoa. That's where I am actually at the moment. And we have centers all over Italy that do different types of research. And we focus mainly on robotics, nanomaterials, life tech, and computational sciences. So Genoa, for those that don't know it, is a relatively small city, but very beautiful at the seaside. This uh, on the top left is a place close to where I live. In the bottom, you see the harbor area of Genoa. And on the top right, you see one of the top touristic spots in Italy, which is one hour drive. Uh, from uh, Genoa, which is called Cinque Terre. Um, let's get back to the robots. Of course, we want to talk about robots today. Um, IIT has created a whole family of different types of robots, and I'm not showing all of them here, but just a few of them. And we will see today mainly about uh, quadruped robots. So these two are examples of my lab, but we, I have many colleagues working on humanoid robots, on plant robots, on uh, wheeled hybrid robots, uh, like these two examples, uh, exoskeletons, uh, surgery robotics, inspection robotics. It's a, it's a big team of uh, different groups of robotics. So to my team, uh, I'm one of uh, 70, 80 groups inside IIT. We have um, these different types of groups. I mean, in robotics, we're about 15 to 20 groups and the rest is the other uh, three research domains. My lab is the Dynamic Leg Systems Lab. We started about 14, 15 years ago with uh, the development of quadruped robots. My lab has grown in the meantime, and I became the leader in the beginning. It was just me alone uh, with my PhD thesis, trying to build a hydraulic quadruped robot. And I'll, I'll show you a little bit more about this historical developments over time to then uh, finally reached uh, the most recent version, which is HiQ Real, and, and there's a, an electric manipulator on top. 
So as I said, I will first talk about hardware development today, low level control, mainly based on hydraulics. Then I will focus on locomotion control developments for different types of gates. That's where we do most of our research in. Actually, most of my team uh, is working on software, on control, on, on planning, on perception, state estimation. And uh, then I will uh, end the talk talking about quadrupedal telemanipulation and ongoing projects. Okay, so hardware development uh, in this community, I don't need to talk much about legs, but the family of walking robots obviously has different numbers of legs uh, from bipeds to quadrupeds to hexapods. I just showed a, a few uh, pictures here and, and today I will talk only about quadruped robots. And um, so this leads us to why we want to have legs. Um, these are two videos that I found on YouTube a few years ago. These are wheeled vehicles and tracked vehicles that can get easily stuck if the terrain gets a bit more difficult. Um, the inspiration of nature shows us that with legs, we can do amazing things. And these are two nice videos that I also found on YouTube. This on the left is a cat that can beautifully, uh, gracefully climb over this fence and, and keep the balance. And on the right, it's a, it's a more crazy animal, this dog called Biscuit that is climbing the same climbing routes where also humans uh, uh, do their climbing exercises. And we can see how animals with these four legs and, and the muscles and bones inside can, can do uh, beautiful things. And, and that is the, the inspiration for us to, to do uh, quadrupedal robots uh, because we see this amazing versatility that is possible in, in nature. Um, the applications that we, we believe are the, are the most interesting ones for quadruped robots at the moment, of course, on the very right, we see inspection and maintenance. We have at the moment many uh, young companies and then older companies selling uh, smaller electric robots that are um, doing many pilots in inspection and maintenance tasks. We focus a little bit more on disaster response, and, and this is not so much the first response that we've seen two days ago with Robin Murphy's uh, keynote, um, we're targeting more the second response. Uh, what I mean with that is that we're not trying to rescue people, but we're trying to then uh, after an, an, an earthquake or after a disaster, we try to use robots instead of uh, humans to go in and, and check for safety, um, check for um, uh, leakages or, or, or for hazards in, in general or uh, sometimes even recovering um, precious goods that are uh, left behind in a, in a, in a half collapsed house uh, during an earthquake. Then precision agriculture, also in agriculture, we um, see more and more the, the need of, of robotics, of course, and, and one of the, the, the ideas that, that we think makes sense is to, to have legs on some of the vehicles to do certain tasks in, in, in more ch challenging, uh, fields where you grow maybe uh, wines where it is more steeper and there's more gaps and where traditional uh, tractors with wheels cannot enter. Then space, we will see at the at the end of the talk, we also have a more recent project that is about space robotics. It's the idea of moving away from only wheels to then have also vehicles with legs to explore more challenging areas like, for example, craters or, or uh, skylights on moon and mars okay let's dive in into the history of, of hiq and uh, let's move back about 11 years so this is in 2010 this is um, just at the end of my phd thesis the hiq robot was assembled and started to move in the bottom right you see uh, two of my former phd students this is uh, marco frigerio and Thiago boventura they're standing on the robot uh, or, or crouching on the robot to demonstrate the payload during standing. So these guys weigh probably about 140, 150 kilos together. This is, of course, just when the robot is standing and the robot starts to walk and the payload goes down, of course. Now, this robot was tethered. It has a hydraulic tether, um, which means it, it brings the hydraulic oil from an outside pump onto the robot. And so the robot is relatively light, relatively because it's still 80 kilos. But the robot is about one meter long and, and can do very dynamic things, as we will see very soon. In terms of degrees of freedom, there's three degrees of freedom in each joint. We want to move the, the foot to any place in, in the 3D uh, volume. And we're using two hydraulic cylinders here. 
and then up here initially it was an electric motor but then it was now um, a rotary hydraulic actuator and we will see a little bit more about this very soon so these are videos of the first steps here uh, you see me a little bit younger than now in the in the back there and on the right you quickly saw the the, the feet now of, of Jonas Buchli who was at IIT he then went to ETH Zurich and is now at DeepMind uh, in, in London. He was working a lot on Little Dog at uh, University of Southern California in around 2008, 2009, before coming to IIT. And we used this code of the Little Dog and put it directly onto HiQ. And we wanted to see how it can do normal crawling. And you see the performance is really horrible. And, uh, and it, we were happy that it moved at all, but it was horrible. and and. We, we couldn't really control properly the joints. And why is that? It's because of these valves that you can see here on the top. The valves that we were using at that point were uh, industrial servo valves, hydraulic solenoid valves that have a certain overlap. And this overlap and also the dynamics in general of this valve does not allow us to do a smooth control of, of all the actuators. So we had to invest more money and uh, by these very uh, high performance MOOC servo valves. These are valves that are normally used on Formula One cars. They're, they're super tiny. This is a one euro coin. Uh, so you can imagine this valve just fits in the hand easily. It's, it's 92 grams and it has a very high control bandwidth. And that's why the Formula One cars like it because they can switch gears or, or, or um, engage the clutch in, in, in milliseconds. And, and we, we use these valves and thanks to these valves, we can do a very good torque control on all the joints. And here you can see a motion of, of a leg uh, prototype that does a, a five hertz sign motion. And you can see that, that the tracking here on the right um, is, is extremely good at, at five hertz. So this is just 400 milliseconds. We can see that the, the position and the, the, the torques can be tracked very well. And when you have a very good uh, a torque control on the joints, then you can start to do nice things like impedance control. But let's have a, a quick look at, at how the torque controller here is in, in the center. So our torque controller is model-based. We know the hydraulic model of the actuator and, and, and other dynamic values. We can then um, use that for a controller. We can feed back the torques that we measure in the joints. In our case, these are load cells in series of the, the cylinders, they measure the force. And we can then, of course, transfer this into a torque. And so this is the, the torque control loop. We can then also have a feed forward controller that can go in here. And that could be a inverse dynamics controller, for example. And we can close the outer loop with the velocity signal that gets transferred into a position signal. And then we can have an external position reference and create a nice impedance controller that lets us emulate stiffness, damping. We're not modulating the inertia, but we can uh, simulate very nicely stiffness and damping. And this works in uh, leg space. So here we see uh, stiffness and damping in leg space. So basically we, we mimic a damper and a spring here between the hip joint and the foot. We can drop the leg and, and at that point, um, Back in, in about 10 years ago, this was uh, really nice because most other actuators with electric uh, motors and, and harmonic gears, they were not able to um, cope with these high impacts. Nowadays with series elastic actuators and with maybe um, direct drive actuators, we can of course do that. But at that point, uh, the performance here of, of this um, active impedance was, was really, really advanced, I would say. And we can, of course, do this also in joint level. Here we have a knee joint um, stiffness that I'm changing. I'm just pushing on the robot with the same force, more or less. And we can see that the robot gets softer and softer when we change here from 600 to 150 newton meter per radians of knee, knee stiffness. And this works also if we map that into the torso space. So here we're interested in the roll and, and the pitch degree of freedom of the, uh, of the torso. And you can see here how Victor Baraswal is, is playing with the different damping and stiffness terms on the whole body. And that this will be important 
for uh, locomotion on rough terrain, as we will see uh, in, in, in the next slides. So let's turn back to, to design. Um, this is HiQ2 Max. This was the successor of HiQ. This is a second version of, of HiQ robot that had more or less the same weight. Again, the hydraulics were off board, but it had a much more rugged design, higher joint torques, and four bar linkage here in the, in the knee joint, which allowed for a larger range of motion and also an improved torque, torque output curve in the knee joint, and the robot could self write. Let's have a bit a look at this. Uh, much bigger workspace. You can see um, this is the sagittal plane, so the plane that cuts the robot into left and right side, if you want. Um, we see that HiQ had a, a workspace here of what the foot can reach with respect to the, the hip that is very small, and HiQ2 Max in green had a much larger workspace. And as usual, we, we build one leg prototype first, and then we, we strap it on a test rig, and we test a lot of it we test uh, many aspects of it. This is a six hertz sine wave on, on the hip and knee joint in the air. And this one is a hopping with, I think it was about 45, 50 kilos in total. And this immediately shows us where our design problems. And then before building the whole uh, robot with four legs, uh, we, we can do a design iteration uh, on, on the legs. Here two videos of the performance. This is in 2015 at RSS in Rome. We brought the robot and we demonstrated this self-writing. This is a motion that allows the robot to um, get back on its feet when it's fallen down. And on the right side, you see uh, omnidirectional trotting, which is the same code that we use also for HiQ that was easily transported onto HiQ2 Max. The robot here was missing power autonomy. You see there's still a, a hose here in the back. Um, attached to an external pump. It also needed a bit more robustness and reliability. And around this time, we um, got in touch with uh, MOOC um, um, and we, we partnered up to work together on the next generation of these uh, hydraulic quadruped robots. MOOC is um, the, the producer of these servo valves that we've seen before for Formula One, but they also generally do uh, actuation solutions with uh, electric motors, hydraulic actuators for um, commercial airplanes, military airplanes, uh, satellites, space shuttles. So they're um, a, a big company that produces um, uh, actuation solution where performance and reliability is really important. And we, we teamed up with them and had a vision to create this robot here. This is a 3D animation. Our vision is or, or, or was to to serve a, a nuclear environment. So here you see in this 3D animation that the robot is, is getting deployed in a, in a nuclear environment. This could be, for example, in Sellafield in, in the UK, where you have a lot of buildings that um, have not been inspected or maintained well in the last decades. And these buildings are starting to crumble down. So people are going in there regularly to, to check for things, for leakages. And, and it's, it's a very hazardous environment. Of course, here the robot might find a few pipes, so the robot has to step over it. That shows that we can't use uh, wheels or, or tracks in this vehicle in, in, in this kind of environment. And maybe also part of the building collapsed. The robot needs to change the gate from a trot to a crawl and then uh, overcome these obstacles here to continue. And in this particular animation, we um, don't have any manipulator on the robot, but we have sensors. The robot can go into the buildings, make 3D maps with the laser, for example, as it's illustrated here, can measure uh, humidity, radiation, acidity, um, whatever temperatures, whatever is interesting for the operators to know in the environment. And later on, the operators that have to go in there, they spend less time in the hazardous environment because they already can plan their, their mission very well with this uh, information. So that, that is sort of one of the, the visions that we have for, for the robot. And that drove us towards um, designing this third version of, of, of HiQ. We called it HiQ Real, real for uh, real uh, tasks, real environments. It should go outside of the lab, uh, have everything on board. So this time, um, hydraulics, batteries, everything uh, on board. So the robot is climbing out again uh, uh, of the building like this. 
So as usual, again, uh, here videos of prototypes. On the left, we see the very first HiQ leg prototype in 2008. It's a different design with, with holes in there, for example, and uh, also um, a different foot. And then this is the video that we've already seen. For HiQ reel, we want to have the leg uh, water and uh, dust resistant. So this here was a video that we have to deliver to a, a, a European Union project uh, back in 2017, I think 2018, and we demonstrated here by splashing water, um, the uh, water and, and, and dust resistance. Can drop also some some sand on top later in the video, but um, I would like to move on, and we see that in the knee joint, you saw probably that there is a special actuator. This is one of uh, MOOC's development. This is a 3D printed titanium body which has beautifully everything inside in a sense that you can have uh, internal paths for electric wires, you have internal paths for uh, hydraulic fluid um, transmission, you have uh, valves inside and if, if we cut it open, we can see that the electronics fit here, the servo valve that we saw before is, is embedded here as well with the first stage and second stage. Uh, we have pressure relief valves, pressure sensors, position sensors, uh, a load cell in the back, and everything comes in a, in a small package. This actuator here um, weighs 1.6 kilos and can create forces up to 7.5 Newton uh, in, in pushing. And this actuator in, a, in an earlier version, we, we brought that to the first uh, Mars uh, event that Jeff Bezos is organizing every year in, in uh, um, uh, I forgot that in California, um, we were invited there in 2016 to bring two of our robots um, and we also showed in this actuator, which is really a beautiful design and, and that actuator sits in the knee joints Then on the hip joints of the robot, we also have um, some uh, rotary actuators, they're all hydraulic with these uh, same servo valves. Now this robot is really a workhorse in a sense that it's power autonomous, it's rugged and it's very strong. It has hydraulic actuation and the peak torque in the knee is 225 Newton meter. And at this time it has everything on board. If we have a cross section through the robot, we can see that the battery compartment is here on the top in the center, in the bottom there's electronics and computers. And in the light blue bottom front and left, there are hydraulic pump units. So there's a pump unit from the, for the back legs and one pump unit for the, for the front legs. And the hip actuators uh, are, are located in, in that space up here. Now, the nice thing of, of having a lot of payload is that we can add different types of sensors. The LiDAR sensor that we saw in the animation, this one here is, is a, an older um, uh, um, sensor head, but we um, have now different sensors on it. In the meantime, we can also add manipulators uh, power tools, for example, the robot has already hydraulic power on board. So if there's a need of a hydraulic um, scissors or, 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 or pliers, clamps, then this can be uh, more easily added to, to an arm because the hydraulic power supply is already on board. So this is a picture of, of the robot in 2019 behind a plane. And I'll, I'll show you more of, of why it's, it's in front of a plane um, in the second part of my talk when I now talk about uh, the locomotion control development, um, static and dynamic gates. So um, I, I concluded here the, the first part, which was more about the hardware development, the history of the different robots and, and the low level control. And I will start now with more locomotion research. There's also uh, a long history of different kinds of locomotion milestones. Here I just added a few, but um, I, I, they, there's many more. Uh, if you're interested in those or in, 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 in uh, papers for uh, locomotion and design, then on our website, you can find all the PDFs. So uh, let me go a little bit through this story now. But before I start, the quadrupedal gates from nature, they have different um, types of gates. Um, mo most of you in this community know that. Also in hexapod robots, of course, we have different gates. Uh, in the... Uh, Quadruped here, what for us is most important are the crawl gates, the walk, and also the trot. And for the trot, we have a walking trot and a running trot. 
and we will see them soon in, in a video. So to present the different research of the, of the year, last years, I divide them into the crawl and the trot, and I build them up in a way that I have different uh, layers, like our software has different layers. Uh, in the very bottom of the, of the software layer, we have, of course, the, the HAL, the hardware abstraction layer. That's where all the drivers sit. That's where the, the low-level joint control is happening, communication and the safety layers. But then right on top of that, there's the reactive locomotion layer. And it's reactive because it doesn't see. So it doesn't use any visual information, no laser, no, no time of flight cameras, no, no point clouds. So it's, it's blind. And these are the, the behaviors that the robot should always be able to do. It's, it's like reflexes. It's, it's things that keep you uh, continuing to walk. So that's why we call them reactive. And you will soon see what, what examples we have there. Then uh, we go up. If you have vision that maybe is reliable, but not so reliable, but you, you still have a map in front of you, you can start to use this visual information to enhance, to improve the reactive layer, just to make some corrections and say, ah, oh, no, that, don't put the foot there because there's a big rock or there's a gap and, and just move it over there, that's better. And that's what we mean with vision enhanced. Then if uh, we have a good map, a reliable map, and we have time to compute, we can do planned foothold. So we can really uh, get a good map of the environment and then the robot starts to optimize and think, how do I put each foot after the next and how do I move my body through that, that uh, terrain? And, and I will now go through those, starting with the reactive crawl. Um, here we see videos where the, the, the robot is crawling. So only one foot at a time is, is moved. And you can see on the left side that there's a, a bunch of obstacles and the robot has to cope with those. And if uh, the robot puts his foot, like the, the left front foot, uh, on, a, on a very high obstacles, then the whole body needs to move up as well so that it can keep the workspace of the, of the leg in, in, uh, away from the joint limits, let's say. And on the right side, we saw a similar uh, crawling over cluttered environment um, in the back of our IIT building. Another example of um, the crawl, and I will uh, quick, quickly stop here. Here we have a, um, an optimization of ground reaction forces. So in blue, we see the ground reaction force at the foot. And we know that we have a friction cone. So the bigger the friction coefficient, the friction behavior between the two surfaces, the foot and the surface, the larger this friction cone. And in this case, we want to climb in this chimney, which is inspired by these uh, human climbers that use internal forces to push against the wall so that they can uh, climb through this chimney. And we, we built a similar thing. Michele Focchi is a passionate climber, so he was uh, pushing for this experiment and, and organize this. And you will see in the video that with um, the optimization of the ground reaction forces, we can then um, map them into the torque, in joint torque space and, and have a, a good crawl through this chimney in which the robot is not slipping down. There's in the paper we published a few years ago, we, we show also a video where the robot doesn't have the optimization of the ground reaction forces and it, it slips down, of course. So these were the reactive crawl motions. Now let's have a look at the reactive trotting. And Victor Baraswal, who's a, another researcher in my lab, he has been developing this reactive controller framework, RCF, which is um, a very powerful um, uh, locomotion framework that is um, built up with motion control blocks and motion generation blocks. And if we have a look at, uh, for example, the, the end, end effect of the foot trajectories, here it's, it's following an ellipse, but um, the ellipse gets cut whenever it touches down. So this creates a certain flexibility to then cope with early touchdowns or late touchdowns. And what does that mean? Uh, an, an early touchdown is if the robot is swinging and thinks the ground is here at zero, so this is the ZTD is the step, step uh, depth. So it expects the ground to be here, but it touches earlier because there's a rock, no problem. It starts the stance phase immediately, or there's a hole, no problem. It just continues with the staff, with the swing phase until it touches the ground. And, and you can see this in this uh, very simple MATLAB uh, simulation. 
Now, uh, this is just one of the, the blocks in here in, in this uh, RCF. We can see the performance here with different videos. We can do a, a trot thing. This is a very fast trot, two meter per second. It's a walking trot. Um, we can also see here a flying trot. That means that there's some moments in which all the legs are up in the air. This is a gait that also horses and dogs do uh, just before the horses do that, just before they change into a gallop. So they do a walking trot, a flying trot, and then they change into a gallop usually. Other things that we can do with this framework, we saw this uh, early touchdown with obstacles and late touchdown. We um, have um, these obstacles on the treadmill, for example. We can, we can uh, just present the robot with different kinds of things and the robot can balance its way through. On the right side, we see loose rocks and the robot can walk over those. And this is all blindly, the robot doesn't see it. The robot can also cope with disturbances. So these are manual disturbances on the left and punching back that hits the robot at random times in the side. And the robot needs to do very fast steps. This is um, inspired by the capture points of Jerry Pratt's team. And we extended that to the quadruped case, which, which allows us to do this nice push recovery. Um, I mentioned also these reflexes in the reactive layer. So here we can see on the left, there's no reflex. It stumbles and would fall. On the right side, we uh, tr trigger a reflex that pulls the leg higher up as soon as it stumbles and it detects a, an opposing force during the swing phase. And here we can see the nominal red trajectory. And on the top, there's a, a, the reflex triggered here and, and the, the leg gets pulled down, pulled up back and, and up to overcome this obstacle. And this is important if, for example, you, you don't see, you have smoke uh, or, or thick vegetation, you don't have a good uh, vision, you want to have these reflexes that, that give, give you a guarantee. Like for us humans, if we don't see a step, we, we usually don't fall, we stumble, but then recover. And these are exactly these steps, that uh, step reflexes that we also implemented there. So in the vision enhanced, I will show you the vision enhanced trot. Um, what I mean by that is, Let's assume we have a map of the terrain in front of us. So we can uh, transfer this point cloud into a, a height map. We see the height profile in front of the robot. Here it is illustrated, for example, with different colors. You have these gaps that change the color. And if you then look at the patch of, for example, 15 by 15 pixels, you can then uh, create this height map around the point where the foot should touch down next. So um, we, we know the step length, we know the, the, the speed of the body, we can calculate where the foot is, is touching down next and then uh, have a look at the, uh, the map, the 3D map around that. And if the, the nominal foothold goes into a, a, a bad point where the foot can get stuck or slip or, or, or uh, there's collisions with the shin, then uh, that's not good. So the, the, the robot, the, the um, algorithm that we developed actually with the deep neural network here, this convolutional neural network, um, it gives a different solution with a more optimal uh, foothold. It's not the, the optimal foothold, but it's a better foothold and, and it, it goes there. And let's have a look in simulation how this works. So the robot is uh, trying to avoid always these kind of gaps you can see that this blue trajectory of the foot uh, directly overcome two gaps. So it took a very long step. And now at this moment, it took a, a smaller step. It stays at the same point uh, for a while. So it, it did two steps here on, on this um, um, obstacle here. And it, it, it needed to wait for the other legs to come back. And then the next step again is over two. So it, 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 it uh, decides in real time for each of the foot individually what to do, what actions to take. And this takes into account the changing velocity of the body as well, which is, which is a, um, an important feature as well to make this more performant. Now we saw the simulation. Let's have a look at the um, experiments. This is work of uh, Octavio Villarreal with um, Victor Baraswell mainly. And we can see how the robot um, can easily overcome at the 0 0.5 meter per second trot. It can uh, very easily uh, overcome these obstacles and make these corrections with the feet to never step, step into, the, into the gaps. 
This also works when we disturb, disturb the robot. So here, Victor is pulling the robot. The robot is trotting in place, and then Victor is pulling it towards the gaps. But the robot uh, um, can do these micro corrections and, and always avoid stepping into the gap. And you can see also a different point of view where it is working very nicely. Okay, so um, let's move on to the last part of these locomotion experiments, um, the plant foothold. So here, if we have a good map of the environment, we can start to plan ahead and make a plan. So the robot here can uh, climb up these steps and can overcome the, the gap that we see here. This would not be possible if the robot doesn't have any vision and doesn't plan ahead how to use the, um, how to, where to put the, the, the steps and, and how to move the body in a, in a safe trajectory so that it's always um, stable and, and doesn't lose balance. And here there's another example with ramps and gaps and steps. And this is work mainly of uh, Alexander Winkler, Carlos Mastalli, um, Janis Havutis and other people. So uh, more newer work here. Um, is a collaboration with Roy Featherstone, who's also at IIT, and Marco Frigerio, who's now at uh, uh, Leuven. He's, this is a, a ninja walk. The robot is, is balancing slowly. See that this is now, this is real time. It was sped up in real time. The robot walks really slowly on purpose so that we can demonstrate how it can balance because here the whole point is that the robot can balance on two diagonal legs and uh, we can have a look also in simulation, uh, in, in, in experiments here, the robot is, is standing on, on these two diagonal legs. It uses the body and the other legs to balance. And when uh, Carlos Gonzalez, who did this work together with Victor Barasol, when he's um, touching it, uh, the robot uh, can recover the balance and come back. Another two works that I want to briefly introduce uh, is uh, Stance. Stance is, is um, an, an output of Shamel Fami's uh, PhD thesis with us. It's about soft terrain. So the robot here is, is walking on a very soft, spongy um, uh, surface. This is a 20 centimeter foam block. The robot has to estimate what is the compliance here in each foot, in each case, and then uh, accordingly adjust the whole body controller so that it can cope with this additional uh, uh, compliance. And we can see in the video how the robot is transferring from a very soft ground on the, on the foam to a more rigid environment with, uh, with wood. On the right side, we also see uh, something that we've developed um, relatively recently. This is the feasible region. Uh, most of you that, that work in, in, in walking robots know the support region, the support polygon is always the, the area that the support legs, the stance legs open up on the ground. And then if we project the center of mass on it um, or the CMP, we can see where is the stability of the robot. And we can then extend this into the so-called feasible region. We, we, we propose this, this new name. The feasible region includes also actuation. So it takes into account what are the actuation limits in, in the joints. And to demonstrate this here in simulation, we will add more and more weight on top of the robot. So there's going to be a vertical load uh, applied to the center of mass. And it goes up to 600 Newton. We will then see how the vertical load here grows to minus 600 Newton. And we will see, we, we see now how this is growing the force and also um, the forces on the four legs, uh, the ground reaction forces in green here are increasing and the feasible region is shrinking. So the robot cannot um, um, violate this region, cannot put this center of mass outside this region because then it would reach a torque limit. And we can see this now when moving laterally, you can see that these uh, legs here are violating the, the torque limits uh, and, and we have a flag that, that illustrates that now the joint limits are, are reached. And more recently, um, we have developed an extension of this. The improved feasible region is now also taking into consideration the 
kinematic limits of the of the legs and also the dynamics because this one here initially was only um, static. Okay, now I promised that we will have a look at high real experiments. Here is um, high real. I will show you a few experiments. This one here uh, are simple trotting experiments in the lab. You see the robot um, is tethered externally to an outside pump because here we're testing if all the 12 joints are working well. We're testing if um, all the electronics and sensors are, are, are okay. So we, we use external hydraulics and external uh, power. And standing up here, the robot has hydraulics on board, and we, we have a first standing up motion, uh, which for us was important at that time because previously all our robots were always hung up. But now, uh, with a, a more autonomous robot, of course, it needs to sit down and get up. Now, to, to try to demonstrate the force capability of the robot, we, we started to train the robot by pulling. Um, objects. Here it's pulling just this uh, light crane structure and we measure the forces that it, it produces while doing that. Now to give it a bit more difficulty, Michele Focchi is here pushing with all his force against the robot. The robot starts to slip. You can see in, in that uh, slippery uh, floor in the lab, the robot doesn't have enough traction. So we took the robot down in the back of the building to, to have a better traction on the asphalt. We have uh, made new feet with, with very soft rubber so that we can have a lot of traction like uh, Formula car ones, the Formula car um, tires, they have also very soft rubber so that they can have maximum grip on the road. So in this case, we're using uh, Victor's car. This is a um, 1.3 ton uh, car. Um, the robot can pull that car without problems. We had to pull the handbrake to, to create enough dragging force. In this case, we then pulled the handbrake a little bit more. I remember it was five clicks. And that five clicks, then the robot really had to um, struggle uh, when pulling. And, and it uh, created about 500 Newton of, of dragging force. Now, this was all a warm up because in the end, we actually wanted to pull an airplane. And luckily, the airport of Genoa allowed us to uh, bring our robot there. Uh, Piaggio Aerospace is a company that builds these small airplanes. Uh, they are passenger airplanes for up to nine people, 3.3 uh, tons, uh, the one that we pulled. And you can see uh, we, we were allowed to attach our robot to the front wheels and, and we use that to, to demonstrate the strength of the robot and, and have a first um, uh, debut uh, introduction of, of this new uh, robot version. Of course, the robot should not pull airplanes. This is uh, something done much better with the uh, airplane pulling vehicles with wheels. But for us, this was a nice demonstration. Of course, uh, the robot has to mainly walk over rough terrain. And, and here are some staged simulated rough terrains, like climbing down a few steps, uh, being on the rubble, or going under a 55 centimeter small um, um, object. The robot was then brought to uh, Rome to Maker's Fair. Uh, here we, we demonstrated the robot to many people. There were also some animals. The, the, the dog here started to bark whenever the robot started to, to walk. It didn't like that. And okay, so that, that um, experience in Rome was actually financed by uh, Enil, and uh, I think we can see the uh, Enil logo uh, here in the back. We can see this a little bit better soon. Enil is the uh, national um, national insurance against accidents at work. Uh, they are financing us with a project. Actually, this is our, all the, the people that were involved in the project that came for this demo, and. Uh, it's about quadrupedal telemanipulation. And I would like to use the last um, five to 10 minutes to talk about quadrupedal telemanipulation. So the idea of actually adding arms on our high Q robots uh, started back in 2012. We were thinking of, oh, we, we have now a nice quadruped, but it can't really do much without hands and arms. Um, we, we need to uh, add one or two arms on, on the robot to, to make it really useful for, for manipulation as well. And these were early concepts of, of two simplified arms that can be then stowed away 
to the back. And uh, we hired a PhD student that finished in 2016, Bilal Rehman. He developed this nice uh, hydraulic six degrees of freedom arm uh, with the same technology. These are hydraulic actuators with these uh, servo valves. We can do a nice force control with this arm. We attached it to the front of the robot. And in this case, we do a joystick uh, end effector control and we demonstrate how the arm can um, uh, move away rubble, for example, in a, in a narrow corridor where um, things are lying around, the robot can uh, push them away. This is Felipe that was a software engineer at that time. So um, luckily we, we got uh, funding from, from Enile um, to have a, a collaboration project inside IIT that combines three, four teams, the advanced robotics uh, team of, of IIT, the humanoids and human-centered mechatronics team, and, and our uh, team, the DLS team, uh, to, to bring our technologies together. And um, I will show you now what different technologies we're, we're combining here in this project. Um, the end user here are the Italian firefighters. They tell us what uh, kind of needs they have. And it, it is really the idea is to create telemanipulation so that the, the, the firemen can be in the operator's chair um, and stay out of harm's way. So that, that's our idea to allow them in, in dangerous situations, um, not for first response, but for um, other uh, dangerous situations where they have a bit more time, but it's, it's, it's hazardous. They can use this avatar, this teleoperated machine. So uh, on the left side, you see the field robot, which is our Q with an electric arm on top. On the right side, you see the pilot station which is a um, uh, virtual reality interface with a hand arm exoskeleton that we will see a little bit more in detail soon. So first, the field robot with the arm. This is an arm developed by the team of Nikos Zagarakis. It's a custom-built arm with their actuators inside. It's a very lightweight eight kilo arm that has a payload of five kilos. It was designed to optimize for picking up things in front of the robot to operate in the, in the front and to stow it in the back if it's not used. And it contains this hairy uh, tool hand that is a very rugged hand developed also in the team of Nikos Tagarapis. Then we mounted his arm, this arm on top of, of IQ Real. And these are some experiments where we're climbing up the steps. The robot here sometimes slips. You see this wood here and the rocks, they're not fixed. Uh, we put them there on purpose to demonstrate how the robot is not falling down, even though it's slipping or, or temporarily losing a foothold with the arm on top. Then we can see how it can also climb under a table. And on the right side, uh, uh, this was already uh, during the, the pandemic last year, we did some ex uh, outside experiments uh, with the robot on rubble. Um, on the right side is the pilot station. So we have this remote arm, um, um, which is visible here. This is the team of Yanis Sarakoglu. He has developed this very nice hand exoskeleton with his team that allows uh, a person to intuitively uh, grasp things. Here you can see how uh, his former stu student uh, Anais is, is picking up ob objects as if she's, she's doing that with her own hand. It's, it's really intuitively. Here, of course, there's a clear uh, line of sight. She can see it. Um, but later on, we will use virtual reality to have a distance in between the operator. Then um, Kaufen, he developed uh, together with Yanis this uh, force feedback device in which the hand exoskeleton is attached. This is a three, three degree of freedom force feedback device that gives a, a, an idea of the um, forces at the wrist. And combining these two, the, the pilot uh, arm, hand exoskeleton and the arm, uh, allows them to do nice things. Here they're catching a tennis ball. Uh, Enrico Mingo is very happy here. He's, he, he caught it. Um, he can do that several times. Uh, sometimes it, it drops, but then he can catch it again. And here on the side, you see, you see Yanis who's, who's teleoperating and, and playing around with this technology. So uh, combining that, we need a virtual reality. This is the team of Nikhil Despande, who's the project manager of this uh, in our project for us. 
And he's leading this team that does the virtual reality part. We can, for example, teleport ourselves into a different location to give the operator a different viewpoint and all the motions are then mapped automatically. And on the right, we see different camera views. Um, here is a video of the end of last year when we had a, a demo. Um, here we're, we're cracking open uh, uh, fire equipment. You can see uh, this is Yanis. He's now teleoperating. He doesn't see the robot directly. He's only seeing through the cameras on the arm and in the hand and on the robot to uh, then do this, this teleoperation. Um, it can then also grab the hose. It can uh, open a door with this teleoperation. Let's see. Uh, here it's difficult to, to push the handle down, but he, he manages after a short time pushes the door open with the, the hand and, and the whole robot walks through it. And uh, here in, in this particular case, the robot was picking up a precious object, which could be jewelry in a, in a earthquake struck a building to um, uh, recover them instead of the firemen that, that would go in there. Okay, uh, if you're interested in, in, in this teleoperation project, then I gave a, a talk in a workshop at ICRA this year, you probably can find that uh, online. Now, last but not least, uh, two projects I wanted to tell you very quickly in the last one or two minutes. We have recently won a, a European Space Agency project together with DFKI, our partner, and, and Airbus in the UK. We will uh, use our locomotion software to make this uh, hexapod robot walk over rubble uh, together uh, with, with the, the partners. And what the space agency really wants is that it, it can try these uh, hexapod quadruped robots on very steep uh, grounds like craters and, and, and caves so that it can uh, in the future do exploration on, on Moon and Mars in, in these more challenging but scientifically very interesting environments. This is an ongoing project and hopefully we can show more very soon. Um, last, we're also involved in an agricultural robotics project. This is uh, with our partner at the uh, University Cattolica in Piacenza. And I'm collaborating with the team of Fei Cheng, Darwin Caldwell inside IIT. And uh, they have developed this wheeled robot with a uh, Franca Mika arm and uh, a custom uh, a clipper to then address the problem of uh, winter pruning of grape wines. So the, the grapes, they um, lose all the leaves, of course, in, in, in the end of autumn after harvest. And then the, the, the plant in winter has to be cut in a way that it can grow in the best way to have the best quality and the best quantity of grapes in the next year. And this cutting is manually done and it needs to have expert knowledge in knowing where to cut so that it can grow um, in, in a suitable way. And we're trying to automate that, we can see a recent demo here where the arm on the wheelbase can recognize the plant, can go and, and cut at the right spot. And this um, works uh, quite nicely now. Um, the, the goal here uh, very soon is to, to bring this arm or another arm on, on our quadruped robot and, and make uh, uh, field trials in, in, in um, cutting these, these gray points. So I'm at the end of my time, I will skip here. This is um, um, something very similar that the guys did in harvesting grape wines. We're recognizing the, the clusters and then approach to cut and, and grab them. And this works very nice with this nice gripper there. And these are other uh, things that we're interested in. To conclude now, um, we've seen the legs instead of wheels are good for unstructured environments. We, we, feel that this is really, really promising, uh, but we need, still need to work on it. There's still a few challenges to solve there and that makes it still interesting for us. The high performance hardware combined with intelligent control is the key to, to implement these kind of uh, high performance uh, quadrupeds. Now we use hydraulic actuation for heavy duty tasks. We can see that we have a, a lot of force, a lot of payload that we can do on our hydraulic vehicles. And what we really uh, want to do is a multi-purpose type of vehicles that can bring automation, digitalization to challenging environments. 
I mean, we have a lot of automation inside the factories. We have automation on, um, on, on simpler fields uh, for agriculture, but we don't really have automation, for example, on construction sites where the environment is, is, is changing all the time. And we would like to bring the automation to these environments. We're actually very soon opening three postdocs. The postdocs we're looking for are in perception for legged robots, machine learning, and vision-based locomotion for now. You can just send me an email if you're interested for more information. There's a special issue that I'm co-editing about state estimation for mobile robots in the sensors journal. And <clears throat> at this point, I would like to thank, thank you for the attention and thank my team for the excellent work that they're doing together with me and, and also the sponsors and, and partners that uh, work together with us. Thank you, Claudio. It was, uh, for me, it was an excellent presentation and it's a fantastic work. Uh, it's great. Thank you. Thank you. So we have a few minutes, a few minutes for a couple of questions and comments. And I see that Clive is already raising his digital hand. So please, Clive. Hi, hello, Claudio. Hi. Uh, many congratulations. Very, very good presentation and, and especially very impressed with the work that you've done over the years. Um, Thank you. I have uh, one question, really, that relates to the, the configuration of the legs. I noticed that in the early work, uh, you had the, the knees of the front and back legs were towards, were close together. And yet in a high cube reel, uh, you had the knees uh, both sort of basically the legs were both pointing in the same direction. Uh, and, and I sort of contrast that a bit with uh, an animal like a, a horse or a dog, where I think uh, the knees are actually, the front and back knees are away from each other. Um, I was wondering if you could sort of comment on, the, on the, your choice of leg configurations and things. Yes, thanks, Clive. This this is a an, an, I would say pretty much open uh, discussion in the community because it's it's not hundred percent clear what gives you the best performance because it depends a little bit on on the tasks. But we initially started with that um, uh, let, let's say elbow to knee configuration because it gave that symmetry on the robot. And it, it, it was completely symmetric. So that for control purposes was, was easier because also the hydraulic cylinders are quite long. And if we had swapped the leg, it would have been uh, uh, created a smaller support polygon. So it had a technical um, explanation, but it also had a more biological explanation because we see <clears throat> um, if we have a look at the skeleton of, of a horse, what we're not seeing inside the, the, the skin and the body is actually that the first joints, they're pointing towards each other. So the, the, what is really the elbow and the knee joint points to each other. Later on, what we believe is the knee in the horse is actually the, the ankle joint. Then it, it stands on the, on the, on the fingernails, no? on the hoof in, in, in a certain sense. Yeah. So of course we would like to have more degrees of freedom, but um, for complexity and cost, we, we want to reduce to the minimum. So three degrees of freedom is, is fine. We don't need to copy the nature to have more degrees of freedom. And I think we later on changed because we figured out that stair climbing is easier with that configuration where both the knee joints point to the back. Right. And this is because you would get uh, bad uh, shin collisions if you have the, the configuration of high queue and, and so we, we we of course then if you decide to uh, have a good robot to climb up the stairs then you have more difficulty climbing down but we have a way in in which we can actually use also the contacts on the on the shin itself when 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 going down and and overall it's it, it's easier but it's a it's something that there's a few papers about this. What is the optimal configuration of quadrupeds? Yeah. Fine. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any further question or comments? Well, I, I have here two questions. The first one is the following. So we are starting to see several companies uh, presenting uh, quadruped robots. I remember Boston Dynamics, uh, Spots from Boston Dynamics, Animal, IQ. But what, what is preventing these robots for from entering the commercial markets uh, and 
what is the problem why we don't see them more often in real applications is it the cost is it, is it the re reliability in your opinion what is preventing us from seeing further dissemination of these robots in real applications so um, i've been following the the field of quadruped robots for quite a while and I've seen that uh, smaller companies have tried to sell them in, in the last decades and, and failed. But, but really now, in the last few years, we've seen an, 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 a big increase in, 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 in these companies selling the robots. And you mentioned only a few. I think there are many more yeah. in China as well. That, oh, that yeah, can... from China, yes. Yeah, yeah. Unitree and, and, and Chiao robots maybe. Yeah, we, we've seen some more recently in that. And, they can uh, create them at an extremely uh, competitive cost. And so I think with, with these young uh, new companies now building up that market, we will see more and more of these applications. At the moment, the last two, three years with uh, Boston Dynamics and then also Anibotics, uh, there's a lot of use cases being done. We've seen them, companies start to buy them, try them for construction site, try them for uh, inspections, oil and gas. And uh, I think these, these pilots will help uh, us and the companies to, to understand what are the missing items to make them really a competitive alternative to, to, to using humans for these environments and for these tasks. And I believe that um, certain um, applications in the field of, of, of inspection, especially, and, and then maybe also maintenance, are already competitive or close to competitive. I mean, I'm, I'm not having my own company, but if you ask the company, I think there are now use cases where it, it, it's cheaper for the user to use a robot than, than, than humans. Okay. So I think a lot will change. And, and of course, um, you mentioned cost reliability. I think the cost will come down as soon as we know how, um, what are the essential things of the machine and, and how to how to mass produce them. Also cars uh, have come down massively with, with mass production. So I think that will, will, will help. And, and we're in an exciting moment because it's, it's accelerating this, this pilot uh, uses and, and, and the sales. So it's a good time. Okay. Also, in, in your opinion, and besides these uh, applications in inspection and in maintenance, do you see um, any more uh, application on which we can, or we will see these robots working in the next, let's say, couple of years? Um, couple of years, um, certainly not space. I mean, to, to space harden a robot, it takes uh, many more years. Um, uh, agriculture, I would, I would hope so. I, I would, would like to see that. Um, but I think we're, we're more focused now on um, construction, inspecting, maintenance. Uh, that, that is where, um, um, at the moment, the, the, it, it makes sense using these robots. Okay. Uh, any further question from the, the colleagues? Well, I think that we don't have any further question, neither comments. Our time is also uh, reached the, the limit. So, Claudio, thank you very much once again for your uh, presence here, for accepting our invitation, for your thank work, you. and also for this fantastic presentation from my point of view. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye. Bye. So we end this session and we will make a short break around uh, 14 minutes, 13 minutes, and we will be back at 10.30 European time. Sorry, 9.30 UTC or 18.30 Japan Standard Time. So see you in a few minutes. <laughs>